Just press. Okay. Not shot? No. Uh, it was on. It was on. <laughs> speak, speak. 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 Okay. It's all improv, man. We're going to talk about it. Whoa, that's loud. Can you turn me down? No. no. Oh, really? Okay. Can you guys can hear me back? What about way up? Whoa, what you guys do wrong? They put you out there. <laughs> they got separate speakers. <laughs> Second grade art class, a little girl's back there just, just working away and it's time to go home. The teacher walks back there to get her attention and she says, wow, you're so busy. What are you drawing that you're, you're so into? And she goes, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher says, well, I'm sorry, honey, but no one knows what God looks like. And the little kid says, looks her straight in the eye and says, they will in a minute. <laughs> so there's improv, right? It starts at an early age. And where do we get our lessons from? Children. They don't, they don't doubt it. They don't hesitate. And through life and a series of things, we, we seem to forget a lot about that. So, today, in the spirit of improv, I have some notes I made on an index card randomly. I'm going to pass them out. And you guys, if you would, read them. And uh, they're in no order, because in the world of creativity and spontaneity and what I do, uh, composition thing, a rarely goes to B. In our linear world, where does A go? It goes to B, C, D, because we're taught that, we're programmed for that, we expect that, that's what we want or else. But, in the creative world, it's different. A may not want to go to B on Tuesday, maybe on Thursday, but it may want to go over to J for a while and then back for a while and stuff. So I took these notes that maybe I made in order at some point, but I'm just going to pass them out, and whatever card you get, I would like you just to read it, and then it's going to tie in somehow to the five uh, steps that I normally teach, uh, you know, students in improv and just people in life in general, and, and I'll just read them. Stay in your lane. We're going to talk about it. The feel. Everything is the feel. The form. We'll talk about that and I'll show you. Um, thought is the enemy of flow. Okay, we'll talk about that. And there are no mistakes. This is going to be tough. All right, so. <laughs> Can you imagine? So, would you be so gracious, my friend? Just pass them, pass them out randomly. Raise your hand if you like a card and you're a good reader. Oh, way in the back. Okay, perfect. Oh, that's what I like. All right. Okay. Do we, do we have a mic that we can get back to? <clears throat> over here. Don't forget over here in purple. Oh, yeah. Is that it? I run out I'm of sorry price. for those of you that didn't get one, but maybe next time you will. Okay. Uh, wait, who, who's the furthest back? Oh, it's a tie. <laughs> oh, wait. You have okay. a card? You have a card? I'm going to come by with no the card. You wait for me. Wait, wave your hand. Hang on. Oh, no. We need music okay. for that. See, see how improv is? Just everything's improv. She's walk this is walking to the back music, you know. Or sauntering. Okay. Motivation versus inspiration. Motivation versus inspiration. Raise your hand if you'd like to comment on that. What is the difference between motivation and inspiration? Yes. With motivation, you get uh, more precise in your art or whatever you're doing. Done. You have motivation to Done. do it. Oh, you need the mic? Done. Oh, wait for the I'm mic. I'm right back here. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Right oh, okay. I'm, you, I'm hang on. Should go a second. Go ahead. Hold that thought. All right, go ahead. Inspiration, um, it comes from your soul. Motivation comes from the environment. Okay. Okay. Well, let's get two answers. Finish, if you'd finish here, and then we'll have something we can bite into here. The difference between motivation and inspiration. No. <laughs> no, it's, I forgot what I was 
<laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, motivation is something that comes from the outside of us. Mm -hmm. You know, a particular goal that, that we want to achieve or something on the outside. Inspiration comes up within us. Um, and we can't force it. Right. We can't make it that okay. happen. So both both answers are great. Can you go with that? Motivation really is doing something you don't want to do. Think about it. So here's a perfect analogy. I think I'm going to go to the gym because when I because otherwise I'm going to get fat and overweight and I don't and I won't feel good. So I'm going to get my ass to the gym. You know that's motivation. Inspiration is God. I love the way these people look when they come home from the gym. I want to look like that. I want to feel like that. You see the difference and feel the difference? Mm -hmm. Motivation. I have to do this, okay? You might be surprised. I haven't practiced in years. But what I love to do, I just did recently. I went on YouTube and I, one of my favorite players, and he was doing an interview, and he showed one of these secrets, like what he was doing. I could never understand by listening to him, and he broke it down. Oh, my God. I was I ran the piano. I was there for hours. Like, oh, this is so cool. So that's different than oh, I got to get up tomorrow this morning. I got to do those scales. I got to learn those songs. I have to do all those things to you know stay on my game. So there's a big difference, and it's a big difference in our attitude and the and the way we live. You guys understand? Any yeah. questions on that? Yes, way back there. Where's our mark? Oh boy, you're gonna be doing oh, some aerobics there. No. <laughs> I'm just not prepared for this. We need somebody back there. Get a few people back there. Okay. Yep. Uh, for me, motivation is more about... Did it just go off? Okay. Um, more about trying to attain something. I've got a goal. i got Inspiration leaves room, leaves room for the process. Okay. I'm inspired. You talked. You just talked about your. Okay. Good. Perfect. All right. All right. So what's going on right now is perfect. This is how I started my day. I called my sister in Los Angeles. Just lost her husband. So I want to check with her every day, and, and she's doing great and stuff. But then, bam, call ended. So I call again, talk for a few minutes, call ended. All right, I'll call you back later today or something. Get a call from my driver. I'm in Riberas, I'm running late. Okay, so we got that. These pants aren't fitting me, I have to keep pulling them up. They won't drop, but they do, they do. And so, so what happens? You know, life goes on, and I'm here on the microphones, you know, so isn't this life? So really, we all are improvisers in our life one way or the other. So I'm just, again, bringing this kind of into uh, a process that I use in my art. And it's, it's so amazing how similar it is to everything we all do. We just, we don't know what tomorrow's all about. We don't know the next minute. By the way, I applaud all of you that live here in Ahik because there's so much of that here. You guys know how to take it easy, you know. Maybe you'll look at your appointment book today. Maybe you won't. I'm always forgetting. <laughs> I'm just glad I made it here. All right, so who has the next card or would like to? Let's go up in front here. Who has a card? You don't have to walk so far. This card. I don't see your hand. Card. Convert fear. Grip. Gradually broaden your comfort this zone. Is, yes. How many are familiar with Alex Honnold or the guy, the guy, or the movie Free Solo? Nobody. A few of you. Okay. To me, it's one of the most inspirational things ever made. Because here's a guy that looked at uh, the face of El Capitan for many years. <laughs> and he had Free Solo of many, many peaks. And he just would go back to Yosemite and go, Nope, not yet. That scares the hell out of me. And we just keep going back and back. Uh, it took him quite a while, and he finally did it. It's an amazing movie if you get a chance to see it. But when he talks about fear, and naturally it comes up in every interview, because in free soloing like that, and this is the highest uh, sheer face in the world, 3,000 feet straight up. No ropes, no nothing, bag of chalk. So when he talks about fear, you know, he said, the day of the climb, he felt good, he felt comfortable, he felt relaxed. 
Because think about it. Think in your own life. You really can't do anything when you're paralyzed with fear. In piano, your palms sweat, you're shaking. You can't do it. You can't do it. So you have to rectify that or, or, or you know, uh, find a place where you can broaden your comfort zone. In his case, found this out much later after I watched the movie in several interviews, he had climbed that mountain over 50 times with ropes so that he knew where that would be and where that would be and that would be. So it wasn't cold turkey. He had it. Oh, yeah. Isn't it amazing? So he said, so on the day of the climb, of course, there's death and here's the peak. But he had 90% he knew where he was going. And then, and, and then what kicks in? Your experience, you know? Um, this helps me out a lot when I feel that, that surge of fears. Look, look, look at my past. What did I do that was similar? And it worked. I pulled it off. It worked. So it's real important to go to our past and look at and look at our achievements. Look what we've done. So broadening your comfort zone, not facing fear. That doesn't work for me. What's that thing I saw on Facebook? If uh, at first it doesn't succeed, parachuting is not for you. <laughs> I kind of go with that one. <laughs> you know, concert pl piano playing isn't for you if you can't play a few notes and not shake all over the place. So is that, do you understand the difference? Isn't that cool? It's a really great practice when you get in those situations. Broaden your comfort zone. It just means you're not ready yet. When I play a song, and sometimes in public I'm screwing around, I go, wait a minute, it's not done yet. It needs to go back in the oven. And what that means in musical terms is you need to go over it some more. Work out the, the, the kinks and feel good with it. And then it's ready to, to serve you. All right, next card. Get ready for... <laughs> ah, she's close. No, that. That? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? No. No, no improvise. You got a megaphone? Okay. Okay. <laughs> when, when you hit the wrong note, it is the note you play next that will make it bad or good. Okay, I'm going to paraphrase that. Um, that quote comes from Miles, Miles David. Davis. Miles Davis. Oh, it says another. Miles Davis. Raise your hand if you've heard of Miles Davis. Of course. Now, Miles Davis was was known for improvising. You know, his mu his music wasn't that complicated, but it was so beautiful. Every note he played, you know, was just so uh, beautiful. But what he said is, he said that he said there are no there are no wrong mistakes, man. It's the note to play after that makes it a wrong note or not. And I'm like, wait a minute, is this guy a guru or what? Because that's really true. It's yeah. really true. You can play, how many of you play piano? Right? So you play a C scale. Is E flat in that scale? No. It's all white notes. Can I make it right? Sure I can. Wow, that comes from the Rolling I know a black door and I want to paint it black. Right out of the Rolling Stones. Wow, there you go. I didn't even know that was there. So I started out playing a C scale, which correctly is all white notes. But I threw that E flat in there, which most teachers would go, what are you doing? You know, but it works. And then I went a little further, which I didn't even know, and it's actually in a Rolling Stones song, that very thing. A C scale with an E flat, and it is, is I love a red door and I want to paint it black. Okay? So, there are no wrong mistakes. How many of you have a problem with that? Raise your hand. Come on. Because <laughs> usually when I say that, what do you mean there's no wrong mistakes? There's this way to do it, and there's this way to do it. But there really isn't. In fact, I don't like to play the same thing twice, whatever. Even if it's the same song, uh, I have to do something different with it to keep it fresh because this moment is different. It's, this is not the same as yesterday. I mean, it's hard to believe in all heat because it's like Groundhog's Day. Every day is beautiful. Are you kidding me? Wow. So, all right, next card, and hopefully you won't have to jog too far here. Way back uh, here. Right here. 
Well, I think this is multiple choice. <laughs> Improvisation is a conversation or sports. Okay, stop right there. That's perfect. I, right, it is. It's not multiple choice. They're all accurate. So okay. let me rephrase this to you in a question. When you're conversing with somebody, when you're talking, are you improvising? Yes. Would it be a nightmare if you had to stop every time and think about your conjunction, your verbs, your adverbs, your English teacher back here? <laughs> it, right, right? So we don't do that. We've learned all these things. We've learned all that in school. And then how it comes out, hopefully, is in a natural uh, communicative way, right? So it's the same in, in improv in improvisational music. You know, it takes an entirely different part of your brain. To play Bach is totally different than just sitting down and playing some jazz improv or some blues or something. You have to actually shut down. But let's talk about it. I was thinking about it a few days ago. I was walking, well, you know, most sports are totally improvisation. In boxing, do you improvise or is it all choreographed? <laughs> it, it better be improvised or it's not going to be much fun to watch. Tennis, right? Do they know the rules? Do they know the technique? Have they studied and practiced the technique forever? Yes, of course. How it comes out all depends on the opposing, the opponent, uh, the weather, the audience, everything. And they do the best that they can, right? And is there anything else on that list? Yes. What? Please. Uh -oh. <laughs> I know, it's a passionate moment. <laughs> a response to the moment. <laughs> which, it, which sort of we just covered in everything else. It's a response to the moment. The phone call doesn't go through to LA. The pants are falling off. The cab driver's late. Spouse said this or did this, right? And it's just, it's Tai Chi. How many of you do Tai Chi? I love Tai Chi because it's such a metaphor to it all, you know? It's offensive and defensive at the same time, but you don't know the difference because it looks like you're swimming. You're just taking it in, you know? 500 pound guy comes at you, you gently usher him to the floor. It's just beautiful. It's beautiful. And so that's, that's life, you know? That's life. All right, we're winding down. Anybody in the back so we get the long walks over with? <laughs> what, right, way back here? Okay. I'm just going to show. All right, all right. Fine. Law of contrast. The law of contrast. Chaos. What else, what else is it? Chaos. Chaos. Law of contrast. <laughs> the chaos theory, as I understand it, but better yet, I like, I like this thing called the law of contrast because we all live in it all the time. When something doesn't work, when it's not the way that you want, right? And I believe pretty much we create our circumstances through our thinking, through our actions and all these things. And so when a situation comes up that mirrors what you don't want, I call that the law of contrast. What's cool about the law of contrast is it's showing you so clearly exactly what you do want. You know? I used to talk to people. I was a headhunter many years ago, right? Uh, which meant I would interview a lot of people, engineers and things like that. What do you want? You don't, what do you mean you don't want? You have a family and you're grown up. And what do you want? You know, finally they tell me. <laughs> you know what they tell me as a head I want money. No, it wasn't money. It was. You would think money was the first motivator in with engineers and no. And, and well, I'll give you a hint. It was in Los Angeles, California. You know what people want in Los Angeles, California, more than money? Get me off the freeway. <laughs> That half hour, hour commute in the morning is killing me. I'll, I've had people take a lateral move and a cut in pay. Mm -hmm. right. So the law of contrast, you know, you're looking at, oh, I don't want that. You know, I don't want it to rain every day. <laughs> you move to Mexico. You know, this is what I do want. So a law of contrast, all I'm saying about that is it just helps define what you do want. It gives you that clarity when you don't know. Don't know what you want? Look at what's not working, what you're in resistance to, and it, and it paints that picture for you. you know? Okay, same with chaos. chaos. It's the same thing. Everything feels like it's falling apart, but things have to fall apart to fall back together again. I mean, one of, one of my favorite improvers, how many are familiar with Keith Jarrett? 
are you kidding? You guys have some homework. Go home. Keith, here. All right. So it's some of the ugliest music I've ever heard because it, the first time I heard him, he was doing two hours of total improv in Germany. It's called the Clone Concerts. And And out of that chaos, he would, I call them uh, tailwinds or thermals. It would be just like, like a glider coming out. I was like, oh my God. But it took this, because his when you're, improv when you're improvising, the idea is to be real. It's just to be real. This is some anger I had this week. And I'm just, I'm just sharing it with you. And some discord and some chaos. But you know what? When I got quiet and in gratitude and just... What's that called? I don't know. It's called Sunday Afternoon in Ahagi, right? Just put a, put a name to it, but it's about a mood. So I had to take that along with his other stuff if I really want to appreciate him. And again, it shows you that improv is about being real, not being right, not playing the right notes, but just going with it. That note feels wrong, make it right. You know what makes it wrong? How many of you play professional mu as musicians, or play out, or any of that stuff? None of you. Okay, well maybe it, anything, acting, any performance thing. A lot of times when you're not really skilled and experienced at this, what do people do? They go, oh. <clears throat> So it's like, look at the mistake. You, you just have a spotlight on it, you know? Like, look at it. And that, you're over. That's it. You're over. But if you don't even draw attention to it, and keep the beat, that we're going to talk about that in a minute, somebody's got the card, and just keep this, you can turn that into anything. She had to be, so we'll get to that. Who's next? Somebody's got that card. Yes. You need a microphone? When I became no, a man, <laughs> I put away childish things. Oh, hang on. Stand up, please. This is a great quote. Check this out. <laughs> when I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. Hang on. Don't say it. Anybody know who, who that quote is by? Can you repeat it? Yeah, repeat it. Just uh, You could say it another way. Say it, give me a line and I'll say it loud. Just give me the first part. When I became a man. When I became a man. <laughs> Go ahead. I put away childish things. I put away childish things. The fear of childishness. The fear of childlessness. Childishness was one of them that I put away. And the desire to be very grown up. And the desire to be very grown up. Isn't that great? C.S. Lewis. He's credible in my book. Are you kidding? Because he was all about imagination. Right? And he says, when I grew up, I realized I have to be childish. What did Jesus say? You can't enter the heaven, man, unless you can play. <laughs> you can't play. You can't be childlike. You can't see things in that childlike, uh, with that vision. Then don't bother coming to heaven. By the way, it reminds me of a great joke. I have to tell it real quick. I know where I'm going. Uh, uh, a woman dies and she goes to heaven. And St. Peter is uh, at the gate. Well, come on in. But first, we have a rule here. You have to say, uh, you know, spell a word. So, any word. She, any, okay, uh, love. L-O-V. Oh, how nice. Come on in. By the way, he says, I have to run in there. Would you mind watching the gate for a minute? She says, sure. So she's watching the gate. Off in the distance, she can't believe it. It's her ex-husband. He's coming up to the gate. What are you doing here? Oh, you're a heart, heart attack. Here I am. I, uh, well, there's a rule. You have to spell a word before you can come in. She goes, well, what word? And she goes, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <laughs> so you know where he is now. Oh, I got off topic. Where am I? Um, so, being childish, right? How important is that? Picasso said the same thing. Picasso. Right, right. And who, who's a cello? Quel, the cello player I just read, who is also 90, in his mid-90s. Someone was saying in an interview, God, I, I rest reading. You practice every day still, hours of the day. Yeah, I think I'm finally improving. <laughs> And I feel the same way. I, as of really about a year or two ago, I thought, 
God, I'm finally getting the handle on this thing, you know, of how to, wow, really, really do it, you know. I've been playing it for 50 years. But it's like, wow, it's like entering a door, you know. It's like, oh, wow, I like this neighborhood. <laughs> By the way, that's a great quote from Oscar Peterson, a great piano player. Another guy, he's like, it, it's just a neighborhood, man. It's just a neighborhood I go to. <laughs> what a great profanity, you know. It's just, it's just a neighborhood, this, this space. So that's what C.S. Lewis gave us. It's a really cool quote. Um, and here's another one. A seven-year-old goes up to his dad, and he says, Dad, Dad, I want to be a musician when I grow up. And his dad says, I'm sorry, son, but you can't do both. <laughs> you know, so again, childlike, that mindset of a child. Uh, we still have cards? Who has cards? Oh, Lord. Okay, good. good. This is by George Sands. Uh, the quote oh. is, Chopin's compositions paled next to his improvisation. Yeah, I love this quote because, first of all, do you know who George Sands was? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, uh, that was Chopin's girlfriend for over eight, eight years. Great movie, by the way, on this topic called Impromptu. If you, don't, if you haven't seen it, see it. It's really good. Uh, but what's so cool about that, that uh, quote is that we're never going to hear that. We're never going to hear Beethoven. I, I, <laughs> I know a lot of reading on these guys. He walked into a concert one day and totally blanked on the entire introduction. People, thousands of people waiting in some chapel in Vienna or something. So what did he do? He's Beethoven. He makes it all up. He makes it work. Nobody even knew. And then he went into the Seventh Symphony or whatever he was doing. You know? So what she said, because she was up close and she would hear him, and she, she used to actually park herself under the piano. You know, she just loved him and she loved the music so much. Uh, but she would have a chance to hear this. And really, um, improvisation is composing. It's composing in real time. So to, uh, to write my stuff and add lyrics and other instruments and all that, what it starts with is just kind of like... And it's really almost like taking dictation. The music like poetry, like writing, right? It tells you. You listen, it tells you. I actually have talks. I had a talk with a C minor nine yesterday <laughs> in a song I've had out there for years, and I was just found this music to it because I wanted to play it. <laughs> really? How come it doesn't work now when I'm playing it? I think I wrote the wrong chord. It got recorded right, but it, on the sheet music that I wrote it. So I was having a discussion with a chord. Some things that happened in the studio, you know? So anyway. So anyway, we, because we didn't have the technology then, they had no way to record those things. So the best works of the great, and ironically, and I'm always talking about this, especially when I'm advertising for uh, a piano lessons and all that kind of stuff, is the irony of all ironies. How many of you took classical piano? Come on. Who did you have to play? Everybody. Everybody. Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, learn all that stuff, right? Because it's just the way it is. But the ironic thing is, all of those guys, and you can Google this, I encourage you to. You just Google the school of improvisation. And what you'll see is Scarletti, uh, Bach, Bach, of course, Bach. He's like the, of, of everything. Bach, Chopin, Mozart, uh, Brahms, all these people not only improvised out in public at bars and stuff, but they taught improvisation. I was doing a workshop, it was actually about like this, about a crowd like this in California for the California Music Teachers Association. They had me come in and talk about improvisation. And I got to one section where I asked for a volunteer. This is what happened. <laughs> exactly this. Not one teacher. So a kid popped up. There was a kid in the audience. And he popped up and said, sure, what do you want me to do? And he came up and I showed up. Yeah, right? And I thought, well, this is interesting. And uh, the teachers that told me, they said, well, you know, it's, it's, this is the first year in over 200 years that they finally put improvisation on the syllabus. Mm -hmm. So when you go for your music degree or your teaching degree, this is one of the things you, have, you will be tested on now. Make it up. It only took 200 years. <laughs> but I can guarantee, I wasn't there, but I guarantee if you were sitting next to Mozart or Bach on the piano bench and having a lesson, there would be all kinds. He would be sitting there, play, make something up, do it, and comment on it and help you improve it. But he would, in, he would interject that creativity. Because without the creativity, you can be the best classical piano player in the world. I'm not a big fan of watching concerts where they're reading. I usually flip the channel. You ever notice that? 
When you watch the great Yucha Wang, anybody know her? Yeah. I mean, these monsters of classical music. First of all, she comes out of mini skirt. She looks, she looks like she should be working the boulevard or something. You know, but, and then she sits down and like, whoa, she's like way up there, you know. But you never see people like that reading the music or anything because they they embody that music. They've literally channeling those composers. They know the music so well. They are with the composer. They're they're in sync, and that's a whole different experience. That's like watching an improvisational concert almost. Even though it's written down, the way they're going to interpret it will be their own. It has to be, otherwise it'll, you'll, you'll hear the difference. Can you hear a concert that's, right? So, oh, they're playing all the notes right. Let me out of here. <laughs> you know. Um, anyway, I would love to get my hands on some of those recordings. I wish they had that technology. Can you imagine? Because, like, Chopin would walk into a pub down the street. You know, they all lived in Vienna or someplace. Like here, you just walk down the boulevard, go to some club, and start jamming. You know? I was in Vienna, and I went to the very church where Mozart had a Sunday gig. And they said, yeah, he played right up there. I was like, wow, he was there every Sunday playing for church? And I was like, wow, these guys had lives, you know? <laughs> and Beethoven was like, like, he was at the bar every night. He's got those little like, out of all the time. But it was Beethoven. Wow. Yeah, oh yeah, these stories are great. I love them. Because they were regular people. And Mozart, of course, if you saw Amadeus, you know his deal. Oh, he was, he was a trip. He was a trip. But, you know, again, they're accessing a different part of the brain. You know, when you look at autism and some of these things, right? These people are so amazing in so many areas of their life, but they can't button their shirt up straight. So, you know, they're, it's showing us that, that that side of our brain is, you know. They've done research with Alzheimer's. I went to a talk by Oliver Sacks. I was telling you about this. Who was, uh, anybody know Oliver Sacks? He wrote a lot of books. Yeah, really top neurologist. I saw him in Portland because the topic was music and Alzheimer's, of all things. <laughs> so uh, he said one of his most severe patients who didn't recognize his wife when she came in, none of his kids, nothing, but he could sit there and sing every song he ever learned uh, earlier, yeah, as in his life. Isn't that amazing? So he's making the point that that's a different part of the brain. It's not the frontal lobe. It's like the spiritual part of our brain. Okay, we're running out of time. Uh, yes? We are told that talent creates opportunity, yet it is desire that creates talent. Say it again, louder. We are told that talent creates opportunity. Hang on. Talent creates opportunity is usually what we're taught. Yet it is desire that creates talent. This blew my mind when I read it. Desire. Desire creates talent, and I'm going with that. You know what I mean? Somebody said, "Well, you can't do that. You should." Do, but if you have a desire, like if you really want to do this, you're you're going to develop talent. And by the way, who was that quote by? Bruce Lee. I would trust him. <laughs> Bruce Lee knew what he was doing, pretty much. <laughs> no, desire is the inspiration. It better be. Huh? It's the inspiration. Because if desire is the motivation, it's like, I really want to be there, so I better practice real hard to get to the gym. It's that same old trap, right? Anyway, okay, any more cards, because we're out of time. Yes? It says belief investments. Wait, what? Belief. Oh, that's, that's quick and easy. We have, I don't know if you invest, or any, most people have investments, and what's the purpose of investments? Because they yield later on in life. And so my thing, all I want to say on that is, look at the beliefs that you're invested in. Because those are the, those are, that's the outcome you're going to see in your life. And I can't, I, oh man, I had a student, I'm not going to not. <laughs> but all she did was rag on herself. And she was, I went, she paid me to go to her mansion, this whole thing. She was, everything on the exterior was perfect. She said, I can never play, I'll never get this, I'm so stupid. She would say something. I couldn't even have a lesson with her. I wrote out some affirmations. I said, pick three, memorize them, and, and call me. Then I'm coming back and not till then. Because you're out of, you're out of, you're out of hand, man. And she did. And she really got good, actually. So look at the investments, like your money, your beliefs, because that's what's going to get you to where you want to go, what you believe about that, achieving that and having that. <laughs> yeah, just channel, what's his name, Anthony Robbins. <laughs> okay, uh, any more cards? One more, I think. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to improvise. <laughs> Improvisation is having the competence to move from one no, to the next. You know who said that? Don't worry, be happy. No. He said that. He said that. 
He said, it's just the courage going one note to the next. And it's really true. You know, I found this in my own life. If I'm not getting the next note, right, well, slow down. That's why you're not getting the next note with any, any MSA. So it's the courage to go from here to here. Go from the E to the E flat with courage and something will happen that, that somebody's probably never heard before. But it's your thing. It's your creation. Any more cards? One more. <laughs> Hold up your hand if you have more cards. So you're left. Oh, two more. Okay. Let's get her and then you. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Yeah. Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. <laughs> You know, stop trying to imitate everybody, because it, 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 that gig's already taken. And I found this for myself early on. You know, oh, this sound like so-and-so. And, -so. and all this stuff in YouTube, sound like this guy, and sound like that guy. And very few YouTube say, hey, be you, I can show you how. That's not too popular. So yeah, be yourself. Everybody else has taken in our final. Wanting to play well and wanting to make an inner connection are often contradictory goals. Absolutely. Right? Do you guys get that? No. Say it again. Say it again. Uh, wanting to play well. Louder! Wanting to play well. And wanting to make an inner connection. And wanting to make an inner connection. Are often contradictory goals. Contradictory goals. Why? Well, number one, you're using two parts of the brain, okay? you know, uh, wanting to be good and all that, it's, it's basically it's ego driven. And so you're going to practice hard because what are we taught? Hard work pays off versus the law of flow, woo-wee, as, as the Taoists say, woo-wee. It's actionless action or inspired action. You do it when you feel it and not a minute before. That's a practice that the Taoists gave us. So that's what that means in my world anyway, right? That I, that I like to practice and be reminded of. Okay, how many, do I have five minutes? Or now four? Oh, five minutes. <laughs> Pressure this gig. All right, so uh, if I have five, any questions? Yes? No, we'll do questions. Oh, oh, no, hang on, no. Okay. Oh, okay, well, hang on. I'll just do these real quick announcements then. I have to do my own commercials. You know, my agent took the entire decade off. I don't know where she is. <laughs> I'll be playing at a hotel, Casablanca. I know, I hate this stuff. i got to make these announcements. This is afterwards stuff? Yeah. No, just Finish take. Up your presentation. This is, I just finished it. Okay. No more cards. Nobody has any cards? Okay. Yeah, Hotel Casablanca. Oh, right there, right across the street. Uh, next Saturday, if you're interested, 6 to 8. Really good guacamole that they give you for free with chips. I know. You don't have to listen to me. Just come and do the chips. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk. Um, Piano for Enjoyment is a, a four week class I'm doing here. Uh, starting on April 26th. If you've always wanted to play piano, or perhaps you play now, but you're not having fun, and you're not grooving, and you're not doing it now without years of tedious lessons and scales, come and, come and see what this is about. I taught this for over 20 years on the road in 60 different cities, colleges, universities. It's like the fast track, but we don't skip anything. We just have a lot of fun. How to read your chords, how to do chords, a lot of improv. Okay, what else? Uh, TMS consultant. Custom songs. <laughs> if any of you are interested, I write custom songs for special events. If you have a special one that you want to do something really special for. Valentine's Day, a birthday, or something like that. Uh, we set up an interview. I interview you. Really get to know what you are about, what that relationship's about, and I will customize the lyrics and the music for you. You get a copy of that, you get the music, you get the CD, and a gift pack, gift wrap. It. Really cool. See me if you're interested in anything like that. And what else? Private consults on this topic, on piano improv, whatever you want to talk about. You know, last year I was here, I spoke about chronic pain. I still get calls because uh, next to having my child, the biggest miracle in my life was healing my freaking back after 15 years. You know, you heard my talk. If you were here, <clears throat> I still consult people. I get calls from all over the place sometimes. You know, just to tell my story and reassure people. That's about all I can do, really. You cured my pain. There you go. <laughs> I gotta send her a check now for 15%. 15% every time she says it. Yeah, so I do that too. I'm, o I'm always gonna do that, because when I see somebody get better, I'm just like, my heart just goes, oh my God. And it's so simple. You're not buying anything, you're not doing anything, you're not exercising. You know, you don't have to go to a witch doctor. None of it, it's just, right? Yes. 
All right. <laughs> okay. I'm done. Right? Any questions? I'm going to be at this little table here. If you'd like to be on my email list, uh, please fill that out, and I'll make sure you get up. You know, whenever I'm doing stuff. Uh, also, there's a flyer for this class back there with the dates and everything each week. I think that's all I've got. Oh, buy my albums. <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to say it, but I am going to say it. So if you go, just pick up a card, go to my website and my store, where you can get my, uh, my albums. They're, ten, they're under 10 bucks a piece. There's only two albums. Get one, get two. And it's stuff that I've done mainly with my group up in Portland and my singer, Marilyn Keller. Oh, she's awesome. And then I have some piano, uh, piano solos on there and some, even some improv solo stuff on there. So it's a real variety of stuff. On there. It's just stuff I've composed for the last 30 years. I think, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much Thank for making this possible. I appreciate it. Thank you.